doesn't run out. So I'm Lénus Valet or Balesh, or however you prefer to pronounce it. It's actually French. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, here presenting on behalf of ST Ericsson, actually, but I'm also working for uh, Linaro, which is my 100% assignment in ST Ericsson. And uh, <coughs> uh, I'm, uh, I'm presenting in the capacity of pin control subsystem maintainer and GPIO subsystem co-maintainer. The main maintainer of the GPIO subsystem is Grant Likely. Um, and I wanted to give you an update on what we're doing in these subsystems over the last, say, two years. I said something like 24 months. <coughs> and um, I give you, um, yeah, some pointers and directions on what to think about when doing yeah, this kind of stuff right now. So some, some, some things have changed and some are new and so on. So, so it will not be a, I won't just throw you in the middle of, you know, of the GPIO and pin control soup. I will try to provide some background as I go along. <coughs> like this. So we need to define the first problem that people have with GPIO and pin control. They don't know which one is which and which one does what. So this is a sort of a definition of it. Uh, in the beginnings of the subsystem, it was, of course, confused because we hadn't quite defined yet which one does what. So, <coughs> But the GPIO is a one-bit signal that can be high or low. It doesn't have to be on a pin out of a you know, package or something like that. It just has to be something that you can set high or low. It can be between, between two sections of an uh, SOC or something like that. It's so just something, general purpose input output pin, or signal, or gate. It could be output only, it could be input only, but it can either drive a line high or low, assert or deassert, one bit signal, uh, or it can read a signal as asserted or deasserted. Whether it's asserted or not, in a certain state depends uh, of whether it's active low or active high. On a schematic, you usually see this, that you, you put the, uh, a dash above the, the, the symbol, and it's active low. <coughs> and um, actually, when we're talking about the GPIO in the kernel, they have very few electronic properties. We do have a concept of uh, wire and, so they can be open drain and open source. Uh, that's another open source. It doesn't mean what it usually does. Uh, <coughs> yeah. the, the, these concepts are very electrical and relate to how you lay out gates in, in, uh, on your ship. And um, we have also the bounds period, but that's all the electronic characteristics of GPIOs that we actually handle. Fr apart from that, we're only modeling something that is high or low, and high is 1 and low is 0. It's quite simple. <coughs> then you may um, have uh, IRQ ships connected to the GPIO lines. And that's another business altogether. That's basically that you embed a struct IRQ ship uh, into the same driver. It doesn't mean that this is actually part of the GPIO stuff. It's just something that's very close to it. So the same driver C file may implement both a struct GPIO ship and a struct IRQ ship. <coughs> and that makes for some confusion. We're trying to make that a little bit simpler. Then the pin control subsystem, that's something else. That's pin multiplexing. That was how, how it began. Allowing you reuse of the same pin for different things. And uh, then it's pin configuration. And this is where I, if we could just turn back time, this is where we would put, pit, put all the uh, electrical stuff. Also uh, open drain business and debounce periods and such things. <coughs> the bounce is this effect when you push a key and mechanically it bounces on and off and this. So if you sample it really quick, you will get a series of zero, zeros and ones. So you, you wait for a while and then you sample it in the end and you get the value for that key. Crystal clear. So this, this is a picture from my previous presentation. I had another presentation one year ago, roughly, at the Embedded uh, Linux conference. 
And that one tried to sort of build uh, the whole concept from the bottom up. So I was discussing electronics and how you build up pin controllers and GPIO in hardware all the way up, and then I took the Linux abstractions at the end. This presentation, on the other hand, is more from the Linux point of view. If you're interested in the, the electronic stuff, then go check that presentation up or mail me about it and ask me where it is and so on. <coughs> but usually, pins are these, these guys here, or they can be called balls, and they can be called pads. And this is the pad ring of a ship. This is an IC right here. <coughs> and um, a GPIO could very well be right in the middle of here somewhere, conceptually speaking. But usually, in most cases, it's the same thing as one of these lines. Or these guys, or these guys, or these guys. <coughs> and this is what the electronics looks like. I'm not going to go very far into the details. This is more like a map of the world. This is supposed to be sort of blue, but it looks grayish here. <coughs> so here, the, this gray stuff, output enable here, input enable, the IO pad itself, input and output. That's the uh, GPIO parts of this line driver. All the ASIC manufacturers have this kind of things. There's a line, line driver block here, and then you map it to different bits in the software. But that's all the, the other uh, presentation. Anyway, the, the GPIO portions is this output enable, input enable, input and output signal. And it all reaches that pad, or there's a pin here. In the, in, but it could very well be a connection over to another ship on the same you know, package or something like that. It doesn't have to be a pin. And then there's always some output driver stage here. That's a regular amplifier, usually two uh, MOS transistors stacked on top of each other. That's called a totem pole. Or, and there's an input stage here, which is uh, Schmidt trigger construction. It has some kind of hysteresis, and sometimes it is software control. So the gray stuff here is uh, about the GPIO. The blue stuff here is supposed to be blue. That's about interrupts in an IRQ generation. And the pink stuff, which here is a series of two maxes, and there's a pull up and pull down resistor. That's the pin control business. That's the map of the world in a simplified case. I'm not saying that the world is simple as that all the time, but could be. <coughs> the GPIO subsystem, it's in driver's GPIO. There is documentation. It's actually. We're trying to keep it up to date. They are a linear and typically these days non sparse number space from 0 to n. And the consumers request such a GPIO line with optionally managed resources and GPIO request. And they can be set as input or output, and they can be read as high or low, and they can be driven high or low, 1 and 0. Then they can be mapped to corresponding IRQs if that is supporting. Actually, it doesn't need to support both input and output even. It could be just, just an input or just an output. But optionally, they can be mapped to IRQs, and then they are inputs, right? Otherwise, it won't work. <coughs> and from that point on, that's the IRQ subsystem that's taking over. So we have a number of IRQ ships in, in uh, the GPIO subsystem. And usually, it's a driver with both parts. Um, and they can sadly be exposed to user space with SysFS. And we have lots of issues with that API. <coughs> this is what the basic operation structure looks like. This is in the GPIO ship, by the way. This is the GPIO lib. There are still some systems and platforms that do not use uh, uh, GPIO lib. Um, there are some who have completely custom implementation of GPIO. So they have some header file in mark something, and totally custom functions that they call. And then there's the compromise in between, which is generic GPIO. So they have implemented a set of operations, like GPIO request, put, get, enable. Uh, you can drive and read the output. This, the functions will have the same signature that you find in Linux GPIO.h, but it doesn't have this driver structure. That's the generic GPIO. That was invented in the dawn of time of GPIO in order to be able to implement very optimized 
compile time wise code to drive especially Bitbang GPIO off the ship. <coughs> it's strongly discouraged to just use generic GPIO, i.e. implement the same functions everywhere because it will lead to the exact same problem that the clock subsystem is facing, that uh, yeah, everybody's implementing the same set of functions with just slightly different semantics. And you can't compile uh, several um, systems into the same image, of course, because then you will have several functions clashing with in the same namespace. So that's a compile time philosophy kind of thing that we need to get rid of. It should be refactored out. The problem for us doing it is that sometimes yeah, nobody's actually running the systems, or there are people, in the worst case, there are lots of users of the system, but no developers. So we can't remove it because there are users, and we can't fix it because there are no developers who can actually test the hardware. So that's a bit frustrating. But you are strongly encouraged to use the GPIO lib, and with the, with the GPIO lib comes the GPIO ship, and it has names and devices and so on. You can request lines here, you get, yeah, like you would um, expect from any specific device driver. Do you see something strange with this, this device, by the way? There is one big problem with it. It's not a device, right? That's just the pointer there, this star. It means that sort of it, it hooks into a device, but it is not a device. A usual uh, uh, device structure in the Linux kernel has a struct device no star here, which means that it is, it is a device. But this is not a device. It only has a relation to device here, which is not good. That's one of the things that we need to fix about the GPIO subsystem. <coughs> and then it uses this. Whenever you try to generate GPIOs of, uh, or IRQs of your GPIOs. And then you can do all kind of stuff. But this is designed for multi-core, <coughs> big GPI, uh, big uh, IRQ controllers on high-end servers and so on. So that's why you find a lot of functions here, most of which you don't use uh, when you implement an IRQ ship for a GPIO controller. Usually you just need mask, unmask, maybe some startup and enable, disable. Um, these are not really needed either. You only need mask, unmask, maybe startup, maybe shutdown. Yeah, and set type. You often want to set type. That's, that's where you go in. For example, if you have a GPIO pin and sometimes you want to configure if it is to trigger on a rising edge or a falling edge, then you use set type. And set wake <coughs> is also quite useful. Uh, that's for that's for this, this thing here, right? The asynchronous edge detector here, wake up enable and wake up signal. Uh, that's basically, when you take the sy system down to sleep, everything is turned off, all clocks are turned off. So nothing is clocked in here. But if you have an asynchronous edge detector, you can still wake the thing up with a GPIO signal. That's one of these cool things that the electronics guys do. But when, you, when you're running it, sort of you're up and running and you want very quick uh, and, and synchronous events to happen, you, of course you will use the, the normal IRQ here on the synchronous edge detector, so it's timed with the, the clock of the system. Otherwise it will be totally unmanageable. So that's the GPIO subsystem and the IRQ ship subsystem. <coughs> now I'll tell you a little bit about what we'll be, we've been doing on the GPIO subsystem the recent two years. This is one of the big things, the IRQ domain refactoring. And we introduced that in the, in the summer of 2011 to translate hardware IRQs to Linux IRQs. Uh, the, the problem is that, um, just as it says here, that the, with the number of GPIO controllers going up in system and showing a rising tendency, you, you tend to want to connect the ever more IO to your SOCs and to your systems. <coughs> we get, um, Expansion first of this um, hard-coded global GPIO number space that you somehow try to allocate in some header file 
with some defines and some conditional defines on that define and on the roof of that one in order to sort of line up all the GPIOs after each another in this global GPIO space, which is usually totally compile time. Um, if you can also generate IRQs on all these lines, you get another set of such nasty defines to keep track of all the IRQ in the IRQ number space uh, for the Linux IRQ number. And basically, uh, Grant sat down and looked at this, and uh, we discussed a little bit back and forth. And it's basically so that Linux has no need of an IRQ number at all. This is like a you know, user thing to, to keep track of the number of an IRQ. <coughs> Linux only wants the descriptors, basically, the IRQ descriptors. Then you might want a nice number to put in slash proc interrupts. You know, that, that's a nice thing. But that number doesn't mean very much to, to Linux. I mean, it's just, it's just a number. <laughs> and uh, the problem is that um, with the rise in te tendency, you, you try to sort of contain and control this number space, and we had to get out of it somehow. So the IRQ domain is just basically a, a very small library or cross-reference table that will convert the hardware IRQ number to a Linux IRQ number. And with a hardware IRQ number, I mean interrupt flag 0, 1, 2, etc., up to n for this very interrupt controller, this very interrupt chip. <coughs> On a GPIO expander with eight lines, all of which can be input, there is usually eight flags that you can read, and you can figure out which one uh, triggered an interrupt. And that will usually then be cascaded of some other higher level IRQ controller all up to the IRQ root on the system. So you get the picture, that's this, this one IRQ controller here in the middle of the SOC or in the middle of the CPU or something, that's basically into the actual CPU, that's usually just one IRQ line, right? So when that fires and your CPU goes into interrupt handling mode, it will start some code that will go to the uh, associated interrupt controller uh, read some registers and figure out from the flags which of the interrupts on that controller caused the interrupt. And if that is a cascaded interrupt from a GPIO or whatever, it will have to go to that source, read another set of status registers, figure out which one of these caused the interrupt, and then reference all the way back, figure out which Linux interrupt number is associated with that very interrupt and call any handlers eventually. <coughs> in order to make that simpler, we introduced the IRQ domain. The IRQ domain makes it possible for you to write the driver so that you only need to think about here in my driver about that hardware interrupt number, 0, 1, up to 7 for this 8-bit controller. And then it will translate back for you into some Linux IRQ number, which is just an arbitrary number, basically. The, the problem with the IRQ numbers is that people have of, often laid them out so that they match one-to-one -one with the reference manual for the SOC or something like that. Uh, for example, Intel <laughs> does this, so there's some incentive to do this. Uh, but when you're seeing interrupt number one in PROC interrupts, that's, that's just a number. It doesn't mean it has to be interrupt one on the... Uh, closest interrupt controller that's closest to the CPU or something like that. But that, it's usually the case. But uh, for Linux, it's just a number. Um, <coughs> so the IRQ domain makes it possible to write drivers where you only care about your specific offset, this number here. Uh, we are, we are, if if you, you look at the change log, you will see that we changed a substantial number of uh, GPIO controls to use that mechanism to trans translate a certain flag in a certain register for the, the GPIO controller into a global interrupt number in the uh, Linux uh, IRQ number space. Then another thing that's happening, this is partly merged now for v3.9, is the descriptor refactoring. And it's, it's driven by Alexander Kubo. And uh, we had thoughts about doing this. Uh, the thing is that when you go into other resources that, that your uh, 
consumer, say, could be a device driver or something. Resources that the device driver is claiming will be things like clocks, regulators, pins from the pin control subsystem, and GPIOs. They are all requested with some function underscore request. You all store them up with a pointer in some kind of struct with your usually your state container. And um, uh, they all are sort of opaque cookies. That's just something you, you grab a handle of it. You don't have to know what's inside. Uh, this is called object encapsulation or something in programming. That's, it's pretty nice. It makes it impossible to fiddle with things that you don't want to fiddle with. Not GPIOs. So GPIOs return a number. So it's some number that's supposedly opaque, but not always treated as, su as such. <coughs> now that's not good. It should be a cookie like everything else. It's just a pointer. You can't dereference it. You can't make a mess of it. You have to operate on it with using certain accessor functions. Just like you do with clocks. You do clock enable, clock disable. You do regulate or set voltage or something like that on something that you don't dereference and look into. GPIOs should be the same. But unfortunately, people have not always done that. Uh, by converting it to descriptors, which are opaque cookies, we, we can get rid of this uh, uh, irritating design pattern. But the most important thing is to get rid of this global GPIO number space. Uh, that's, and that's important for the other uh, thing I mentioned earlier, that you just tend to stack up a lot of defines in your platform. They're all defined at compile time. If you compile several platforms into the same binary image, you will have to do something like hmm, roof the number of GPIOs so that I am sure that all the platforms I compile into this image will fit in this space. And it can be a lot of space. So we have started to move around the code to use such uh, descriptors internally in the GPIO lib. And um, yeah, that's basically it. it. Much of the des design and desire comes out to the IRQ number space with the problem that I just described, that interrupts are, not, uh, are just numbers. They should be opaque as well. Um, and the, as, under the transition period, we will have a possibility to map GPIOs to descriptors and vice versa, back and forth, uh, just like we do with the IRQ domain, where we can map hardware IRQs to, to Linux IRQs. And uh, some of the basic infrastructure is in place. Uh, but then we have this, this little debate that is not resolved, because Grant is the, other, is the actual GPIO subsystem maintainer. He doesn't like um, error pointers. Usually from this re request function or get function, we, we get something that yeah, it, might, it might be a pointer or it might be an error code. So you have to do something like this, employ the, the is error. A macro on it to figure out if this pointer is valid or not. And uh, that, that's a dubious design pattern. I mean, this, it's not exactly elegant. It's one way to do things in C that, that is easy to do in other languages, but uh, here you have to do things like casting. So the, 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 uh, the pointer is actually casted into an uh, unsigned long, I think, or no, a signed long, and then if it's negative, then yeah, that's an error code. Um, <coughs> if it's negative in the, the beginning of the neg negative er number space, <laughs> then, then it's an error code. If it's higher up, then it's probably a pointer and so on. So um, we don't know how that's going to be solved. I had had an idea to talk to some toolchain people about whether we can actually <coughs> tweak the compiler to annotate pointers or something like that, so it would be easier to use these macros and get compile time warnings if you don't check the return value or something like that. So we don't know actually how to resolve it. Right now, we have to basically just review all the code. And Grant doesn't like that, so we we'll have to find our way about, it, about that. Then another thing that's been proposed for the GPIO subsystem is blocked GPIO requests. <coughs> and this could be um, a kernel internal thing. Um, 
And basically what it does is that it's, uh, it tries to deal with this problem that you need to toggle two values, GPIO values, at the same time with, with an infinitesimal uh, time delay between the two. Which is easy to do if it's, if it's just like an 8, 16, or 32-bit register. If you write all the bits at the same time, of course you can toggle all the lines at the same time. You can toggle all the 32 lines at the same time, up and down like this. <coughs> um, and people have done out of tree hacks for, for this, for different embedded systems. I think uh, Jean-Christophe told me that they had something like this for the 1891, and uh, I've heard about other things. Roland, who's writing the, the, the patches here, also has uh, this for some system, and so on. So this is driven by user needs. People really need to do this. The problem is just how to do it. And uh, myself, I'm, I'm OK with it for kernel internal interface. So if I'm using some bit banged I2C driver, for example, I don't, I don't see any problem with sort of using this kind of interface to get two lines that I can toggle at the same time so I can toggle the clock and the data line exactly at the same time. I mean, that, that, that's obviously, that's good to be able to do that. We won't be able to for any bit bank drivers to guarantee the width of pulses or anything like that. We'll only have like a, a minimal guarantee. The length of them can be anything. But as Roland explained to me, the problem is not the length of the pulse. The, the problem is the time it switches. So that's something we can solve with this API. We can't create perfect waveforms or anything like that. We won't be able to do that without uh, hard real-time patches. But we can make sure that, that two lines toggle at the same time. So this is going to be merged, I guess, in some form. The biggest problem is with the user space API, uh, ABI, which is in SysFS, <coughs> because Roland wants to use this in, in, uh, in from, from user space, <coughs> because they have some display array or something like that. Basically, that's, that's unpleasant for the maintainer of the subsystem, because if we put the user space API in place, we have to maintain it perpetually. And if we break it willingly, because we say that uh, this is not elegant, we want another user space API, there is some guy called Torvalds that's going to hit us on the head so hard. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not going to happen. We can't put the API ABI in place that we're not able to maintain perpetually. There are, I mean, he has flamed so many people for this kind of stuff, so we're not going to be another one in the line of people doing that. <coughs> so. OK, if we can come up with an interface that we really love. Actually, I don't like any of the SysFS ABIs because they are racy and strange. And you know, basically, I would like to transfer the whole thing over to a proper device or something like that, a character device. But um, then I have to do it myself. So we'll see about it. But that's being discussed right now. And I guess that, that, that for the in-kernel API, we're definitely going to merge it. Then what's going to happen next in the GPIO subsystem? Yeah, we will get this descriptor API in place. Then we will have to go in, and all the drivers will have to include a file called Linux slash dot h or something like that, and do real requests of things, reference their GPIOs from the devices, uh, couple the resources so that the GPIOs are tied to to, uh, to their devices in the device model, which is nice. Then th this SysFS K objects. Uh, if you've looked at this code, what, what it actually does, what the GPIO subsystem does to get uh, handles in SysFS for all the GPIO pins is that it creates a dummy device. So it just calls create device and then attach the SysFS files to it. It doesn't mean that it attaches the SysFS files to the actual GPIO uh, the control, because it has exactly that problem that I pointed out before. It's not really a device. <coughs> so that needs to be fixed, obviously. You should tie this kind of things to the, to the actual device, and the, the, the GPIO uh, chip should contain a real struct device. That needs to be fixed. Then we need to think about the future user space API. Input is welcome. Send mail to the mailing list. Uh, then I have the same kind of two bullets for IRQ, ship, GPIO, and pin control. Because 
when you get the picture like that, when you're involving three different subsystems for the same hardware, like this, I mean, do you think it's easy? I mean, can I make this easier to use? Of course, I mean, this is complex stuff. It's not, it's not simple. It's not like going to shop groceries or anything like that. But maybe we can do things in the, in the uh, subsystem structure that makes it easier to, to uh, create IRQ chips and pin control coupled in deeply with the GPIOs. Maybe. I don't know. I don't see any simple way to do this, but maybe, sort of. Maybe we can always supply an IRQ chip on a, a GPIO controller, for example. Or will people think that that's like footprint wastage? Or, yeah. Then GPIO hogs is another thing that came up on the mailing list. <coughs> so some systems will have a number of GPIOs that they just set up as inputs or outputs when they boot. Sometimes to read uh, an ID number that's hard-coded with some straps on the inputs and uh, sometimes to just drive some lines that power some Ethernet adapter or something like that. Um, when we were just using board files for all the ARM stuff, that was quite simple. You would just write some code and then a hard-coded GPIO number and just get request it and put it to one. Uh, that's not exactly elegant in the context of device trees and such things. Uh, so uh, we need to, to come up with some mechanism that you, you can do this kind of stuff without needing special board code. Or you can duplicate it with just scanning you know, the, the device tree nodes and manually or <laughs> machine-wise pick them out and raise them to one, which I have done myself. But maybe it's not that elegant. GPIO hogs would be a better way so that the GPIO subsystem would take these at boot and read out the proper values from the device tree and then sort of set them to zero, one, or read them, or something like that. <coughs> okay, that's GPIO. The pin control subsystem, on the other hand, are we done any questions on GPIO? I think we've got lots of time, so if you've got something to ask. Okay, let's go into pin control as well, and then we will get the big picture. Pin control subsystem lives there. Uh, I have a documentation file for it, it's updated. Am I talking in a monotone voice that makes you sleepy? <laughs> <laughs> or is it just because you just had dinner? It's so silent. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I would blame it on my you know, sort of cold or influenza, or whatever it is. <coughs> Drivers employing pin control, they can, they can uh, control pins in a controlled way. No, well, they, they, uh, they will uh, help you with when you're multiplexing stuff for example, and when you're uh, cross-referencing pins to the GPIO subsystem, and they will um, uh, also handle like a configuration of different electrical properties, just like I mentioned. Pull up, pull, up, pull down, drive, strength, and such things. <coughs> hmm? And we have hogs, like I mentioned for the GPIO subsystem. We have hogs so that you can sort of hog a certain configuration or a state, as we call it, and enable it on boot. So you don't have to deal with it from the uh, somewhere else, from the drivers, for example. <coughs> but the signature of the functions are very familiar. You get pin, pin control handles, you enable them, you disable them. You put them, uh, but we have replaced it with uh, states for the intermediate term. So it's the pink stuff here. Maxis, pull up, pull down. Hysteris, hysteresis control could be, uh, for example, here. I said that this is usually li like two MOS transistors on top of each other in a totem pole. If you add another pair, you have a double dri drive strength through that totem pole, right? You can drive it with uh, twice as many microamps or milliamps. It's typically something like three milliamps per driver stage. So if you enable several driver stages and that is software controlled, it's a pin control thing. <coughs> the basic API looks like that. There's not very much here because all the details are in here. 
which is another set of ops. So there's a box you open and there's another box inside. It's like a matryoshka doll, this Russian thing. But um, <coughs> when, when you register such a thing, you will get the real struct device. It contains a real struct device, the pin controller. And uh, it lists groups and so on. That's not very clear. It was invented in a response to the churn in the ARM architecture. If you were to Olaf's, Olaf's uh, session this morning, you, you got to know about this, you know, uh, Linus Torvalds rant about uh, the uh, uh, state of the ARM subsystem. One way to solve it is to take drivers out of Arc ARM, and one place to take them is to the driver's pin control subsystem. If they are pin controllers. And it actually, in the beginning, I tried to move all this stuff to the GPIO subsystem. So I wanted Grant to export GPIO to ship so that I would be able to add a lot of custom functions to all of my drivers, my GPIO drivers. For example, NMK for nomadic pull up. So come on, just a little function, add it. <coughs> But in order to add it, I need to, to sort of dereference the GPIO number that I wanted to pull up so that I could get out the struct GPIO ship so I could get to the memory range where it was sort of implemented. So Grant, can you, can you let me have it, GPIO to ship, so I can just sort of you know, dereference the GPIO number so I can get out the uh, GPIO ship struct so I can sort of implement, yeah, pull up, pull down, all that stuff with uh, custom enumerators. And he said no. You're not going to have it. And as I say, ironically, it's, it's exported now, but for different reasons. <coughs> but uh, the idea is we do not ex uh, expand the GPIO subsystem with all this stuff. And the uh, main reason for not doing that, in why, why is not everything handled by one subsystem? It's the main reason is that GPIO has a global number space. And the global number space totally sucks for device trees because they want to assign resources dynamically. And now we have the pin control sus subsystem, which is totally dynamic. It can handle you know, dyna dynamic pin controllers coming and going and assigning some random pins and so on, naming them and enumerating them and interacting with them. But um, uh, then, then, I, then I also have the, the old GPIO subsystem, and I have to live with it. So that's why we have this cross-reference mechanism that's called GPIO ranges. Um, I suggested this in 2011, and iterated and iterated, and then it was merged for kernel 3.2 with support for a le legacy controller, the U300. But basically, I used it as a yeah, guinea pig. And then the Surf Prima 2 was the second one. In the kernel 3.4, which was a year ago or so, we introduced pin configuration states, and we refactored the API so that um, you get a struct pin control handle with pin control get, and then you have to get named states out of that pin control handle in order to be able to switch uh, your handle into different states. So it's not just enable, disable anymore like with a regulator, or it's more like set voltage, <laughs> so that you can actually go with your pins into different states. And the states contain, for your specific handle, both MUX settings and different configuration settings for the electrical properties of these pins. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just making fun of you. So it's, it's like, uh, yeah. yeah, you can look at the map. You ask your question while, while they look at the map. Yeah, um, back to GPIO, you talked about uh, debounce yeah. being supported. Is it expected to be done in hardware, or is there some software element to help debounce, or is it dependent? I think that actually the, um, if you don't support it in hardware, now, now I'm, just, I'm just reciting from memory. If you don't support it in hardware, there is a callback which you can make in your driver to support it in hardware. If that is not available, if that callback is null, the subsystem will uh, employ that with a timer. It will, set, it will uh, just you know, delay and then read. So are there plans to use a timer like that for other instances? For example, um, um, what if it's a pretty fast event and I don't catch it in my pole? Maybe I want to latch a software. Library. 
I haven't thought of that. I never had a request before. Oh. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have the bounds, but yeah. but that, that's yeah. as far as it goes. Okay. So uh, maybe I mean, in the pin configuration API down here, we set a number of properties which are just enumerated things in in the, that that you can configure the hardware for the pins for. So so if it has some bits in a register which you can write to set something up which is related to anything electrical, it goes down here. So definitely, if, if your hardware supports latching, that's a pin control business. Uh, whether to fall back to software when that's not available, that's another thing. Uh, well, that, actually, you want a high speed pull. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I don't know if that's the proper division of things. Uh, the the uh, the pin control subsystem doesn't pull anything. It's just the GPIO subsystem doing that. So maybe it's right to have the you know debounce and such things up in GPIO now. I don't know. Or maybe it needs to be adapter on top of of, of the GPIO subsystem. No. But uh, I mean this this is a rough map of the GPIO subsystem. This is where your driver go in and take a pin control handle. It could actually be taken by the subsystem itself through a so-called hog. The subsystem may have several such hogs for different things. Then it, it maps functions, which is basically that I have a UART, to groups, which is actually I have like these five pins and they can actually be the UART. So one such function may have several such pin sets. And um, the pins all have names. So you can put them into such groups that can be connected to a certain function. And then they, we have this bolt-on GPIO range thing to cross-reference GPIOs from the global number space. And then the GPIO subsystem may want to set the direction of a certain pin, and that's best uh, employed by the pin control subsystem. So there's set input and output down here, and you can sort of, otherwise it's just request and freedom. And then this will be like a backend to the GPIO subsystem. This is expl explicitly a backend. And um, the configuration stuff goes do on down here. Uh, it's all related to pins and have, could also be groups, because in some hardware you can set electrical properties for an entire group of pins. And it's just like uh, the functions to group mappings. It has a one-to-many relation to the handle you have up here. So now you realize that you can just, uh, you can just <laughs> get your handle here, and then you look up a state, and then you have fun with it. And then all this stuff goes on in the background. Did you learn this way of writing, uh, sort of sketching things in engineering classes? Was it any fun? <laughs> I think it's actually better to read the code. I mean, it, it's, but, but it gives you one little piece at a time. Or you can take that map and you can sort of bring it up on Christmas Eve on, or whenever you're really bored and you know, just look at the code and cross-reference the map. <coughs> but all of these systems have actually... So, so pin control is a, is a huge success. I mean, it's massive success. One of the, be the most successful things we did with, uh, with Linaro because we brought over not only my pet systems, you don't care very much about them, but also the Surf Prima 2, the NVIDIA Tegra, Serious, the Marvell things Thomas did, and uh, yeah, including Armada, inc including legacy systems like the Kirkwood and the Dove. Uh, Freescale was brought over uh, by Sean Gu, and uh, oh, I forgot this other gentleman that's working on it, but a lot, three different people at Freescale contributed to this. ST Microelectronics Spear. Uh, which is set-top box uh, machine, I think. Uh, Jean-Christophe co uh, converted uh, the 1891. Samsung by Thomas uh, Abraham. Uh, Exynos, the new platform. From the, the, the old legacy platforms, Samsungs are not converted yet, but we're getting that. Oh, five minutes, wow. Um, 
the Broadcom was converted. Uh, then uh, Tony down here has created the single one, which is an abstract variant for all maps, and which now also going to be employed by High Silicon Right. That's the name, the uh, the, uh, the Huawei guys. And um, we have also two non-ARM architectures, which is uh, especially fun to see. We have uh, the MIPS, Lantic, Falcon, X-Way, and the Super H uh, things that are not SH mobile. Of course, the ARM SH mobile I is being converted by Laurent Pinchot. And the uh, next on the hit list or wish list or whatever you want to call it is the old Samsungs, the old OMAPs, the DaVinci, EP93X, and the, uh, the Qualcomm NMSN platforms. I am convinced I will get them in there sooner or later. Next, we will have, yeah, these things are going in. I sent a pull request to Linus Torvalds this morning. Grabbing of default handles from the device core, we, we realized that a lot of devices would just get pin control, get enable default. So I would look at my default state and enable that, and I wouldn't touch the game. Uh, Dmitry Torokov, the subsystem maintainer for the input subsystem, didn't like that kind of boilerplate to be added everywhere. So we discussed it back and forth uh, with some gentlemen like Mark Brown and uh, Greg Croa Hartman, and we actually put it into the device core. So the device core will look it up and enable it for you. There are some like probe deferral things to think about there, but it basically works. Then we have added sleeping hogs. So uh, even if you take all your um, pin control handles with uh, hogs, they will be put into sleep state when, if there is a sleep state defined when you go to sleep. <coughs> so it's a, it, it, this, uh, the subsystem implements uh, suspend or resume for you if you're using HOG. Um, we have a PCI driver on its way in. We have uh, thoughts about making this business easier. It's not easy as long as the uh, GPIO uh, is, is using a global number space. But I, I added a function which is like GPIO ship add range mapping or whatever I called it, that's at least sort of only look, using the local GPIO numbers to cross-reference and that make, making it a little bit simpler. Um, we should make the generic portions of pin config more generic. I think uh, Hao Yan is adding it to the single uh, variant, for example. Uh, and uh, we might, the way we have solved device tree bindings right now is just sort of put in a function and let you do it the way you want in your driver. Just create my pin control map for me. Uh, it's not uh, entirely helpful not to have standardized device tree bind bindings. We need to think about that. Um, maybe we want the pin controller to be able to model an entire GPIO ship and maybe the IRQ ship as well, as I said. Maybe I can provide some helper PM in lines because, because this code tends to be duplicated everywhere. Maybe we need to use them from user space. Preferably not, but people always come up with that kind of stuff. Hey, I'm on time. Any questions? <laughs>